Well, if you go out uh, back behind the church right now and, and look at my truck, you'll see an interesting juxtaposition. You know what a juxtaposition is, right? Oh, by the way, kids are dismissed to Sunday school with, with uh, Miss Lauren. You're welcome to leave now. But you know what a juxtaposition is, right? It's when you put two things, often things that are contrasting side by side, kind of get that effect. So if, if you go outside and look at my truck right now, you'll see on the front of my truck uh, an Ohio State logo license plate. And on the side, you'll see a magnetic decal that appears every football season from somewhere. Uh, with, that's, that's an arm carrying a football that looks like it's coming out the driver's side window. And you'll see on the back, on the rear window, on the passenger side, a Brutus Buckeye sticker. And you'll see an Ohio State decal, uh, Ohio State dad decal on the other uh, rear uh, side of the rear window. But then if you look down at the license plate, you'll see the spectacular Peninsula's version of a Michigan license plate there. Now that plate is there because I live in Michigan, not Ohio. And it's not like I just moved here either. I, as of August 1st, I've lived here in the Traverse City area for 25 years. I moved up here on August 1st, 1996. I'm not like a recent transplant. And to be honest, I love Michigan. Well, most of the time. I even like winter until it slops over into spring, which it seems to do every year. March and April and sometimes May are tough months for me. But the rest of the time, I love it here. I'm proud to live in Michigan. And when I first moved up here, my mom was like, well, you'll have to be a Michigan fan now. And she bought me some U of M stuff to wear. And I tried to. I really did. But it just wasn't happening. I couldn't do it. I really did try it. I actually wore it a few times. And it just, I'd look at myself in the mirror and I'd think, that's just not me. But I promise I tried. And I have no desire to live in Ohio again. I like it here. But while I live and love one live in and love one state, Michigan, part of my heart still lives in Ohio, I guess. With the sports teams I grew up rooting for. My Buckeyes, my Bengals, my Reds, although I have adopted the Tigers too. I want credit for that. And the Red Wings. But in, in, one, in some ways, I live in one kingdom, but parts of my heart are still in another one, at least during the fall. I think a lot of us who follow Jesus are kind of like that. We live partly in the kingdom of God, or we live in the kingdom of God, but sometimes our hearts are somewhere else. Our ultimate loyalty is kind of divided. You know, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. Many of his parables started with the words, The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, a treasure, a pearl, yeast. In Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When the Pharisee Nicodemus came to Jesus one night under cover of darkness, Jesus told him, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And when Jesus teaches us to pray, he tells us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So this fall, we're walking through the Lord's Prayer together, one phrase at a time, and we've looked at the phrase, Our Father, and we looked at the phrase, Hallowed be your name, and today we're diving into the phrase, Your kingdom come. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Starting in verse 8, or verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And over in Luke, Luke's rendition of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom. What are we praying when we say those words. 
Do you realize that if you're following Jesus, you are first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God? The kingdom of Christ? Not of Canada or the United Kingdom or the United States of America. You're likely one of those two. And that's important. But you are first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles in this world. He was writing to people who had national citizenship somewhere. But they were sojourners and exiles in this world. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, talking about the ancestors, our ancestors in the faith, people like Abraham and Moses, uh, says this, These all died in faith, Abraham, Moses, and the others, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. But it's St. Paul who gets the most direct when he says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. We may be citizens of the United States of America, but we are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God. We may honor our stars and stripes, but there's another flag that holds a higher place in our hearts and minds and lives, and it's the cross of Jesus Christ. Pastor and author author R.C. Sproul told this story from his days when he was a student in seminary learning to be a pastor. And he says, when I was in school, I was a student pastor in a Hungarian refugee church in western Pennsylvania. It was a little church, a little group of about 100 people, many of whom didn't speak English. And someone donated an American flag to the church, which I placed in the chancel across from the Christian flag, just like we have outside our doors. He said, my crisis came the next week when one of the church elders on the board, who was a veteran, came to me and said, Reverend, you've got it all wrong there on the chancel. And I asked, well, what's the matter? And he said, well, the law of our land requires that any time any flag is displayed with the American flag, it must be placed in subordinate position to the American flag. And the way you've arranged it here, the American flag is subordinate to the Christian flag. That has to change. He says, anyone who's lived outside this country knows how wonderful this place is. I love it, and I honor it, along with its symbols, including the flag. But as I listen to this elder speak, I ask myself, how can the Christian flag, and really he's talking about what that flag represents, not the flag itself, be subordinate to any national flag? The kingdom of God trumps every earthly kingdom. I'm a Christian first. I owe allegiance to the American flag. But I have a higher allegiance to Christ because he is my king. So I had a dilemma. I didn't want to violate the law of the United States. And I didn't want to communicate that the kingdom of God is somehow subordinate to a human government. So I solved the dilemma easily enough. I took both flags out of the church. Now we can and we should honor and respect our nation, our leaders, and our national symbols. But we are followers of Jesus First. So whether the president has the name Bush or Obama or Trump or Biden, as Christians, we must pray for them. And whether the president is a Republican or a Democrat, we serve Christ first. We follow Jesus first. Whether you agree with the president or not. Because no president, former or past, aligns perfectly with the kingdom of God. It doesn't happen. No political agenda does. We are standard bearers for the kingdom of God. And in this day and age in America, that's offensive. 
to men. I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God, and I pray thy kingdom come. Now in the Bible, in the New Testament, the New Testament speaks of the kingdom of God as both a present reality and a coming reality. In Luke 17, 20 and 21, we read uh, that Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. And he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Saying the kingdom of God is already here, right in your midst. You're looking at it. But then, in Luke 19, Jesus tells a parable to illustrate the equally real truth that the kingdom of God is yet to come. It says, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Now, he's already told them it's in their midst. But because they supposed the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, he said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And then he tells the parable of what we call the parable of the talents. The context for that parable, the telling of that parable, was to illustrate the truth that the kingdom of God is not fully here yet. And so he tells the parable of leaving of a, of a master who, who, who go, a nobleman who goes to receive a kingdom, to receive land. And he tells his three servants on his current property, uh, he gives each one of them some resources, some money. And, and the parable is about what each of the servants did with the money while he was gone. One invested it well and, and got a great return for his master. And, and one did an okay job and got a decent return for his master. And then one hid his coin away and did nothing to make it grow. And he gave back to his master the exact amount his master had entrusted to him. And the first two were greatly rewarded and the third one was punished. But notice the reason Jesus told the parable. Right? They supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. And he told a story about a nobleman who leaves for a while and then comes back. The parable was designed and intended to teach that the kingdom of God is coming. So according to Jesus, the kingdom of God has come and is right here and is yet to come. So how does that happen? Because the truth is, it's both. In Christ, it's here now. In every human life in which Christ reigns, the kingdom of God is present. But it is not a geopolitical entity on earth. You can't Google where is the kingdom of God and get a Google Maps path with bike, walking, and driving paths um, to, take, to, to enable you to get there. Even those who are looking for it can't always see it. And certainly those who are looking for it can't see it. But those who were looking for it sometimes missed it when Jesus was standing right in front of them. It's a present reality in every life that is submitted to Christ right now. But it's not yet here in its fullness. We've not yet come to the time when as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That time hasn't come yet. But the kingdom of God is alive here and now in your heart and in mine. We are standard bearers for the kingdom of God. In this world. Now sometimes you'll hear Greg say something about us living in the now and the not yet. And that's what he's referring to. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. A present grace and a future hope at the same time. And like every kingdom, the kingdom of God has boundaries. Citizenship is, in the kingdom of God isn't something you're born into when you're born to Christian parents. 
You know, if you're born in, in the United States of America, you're, you, know, you are automatically a citizen of the United States of America. But it isn't the same way with the kingdom of God. Citizenship in God's kingdom is voluntary. But there is a boundary. And that boundary is the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And while there's nothing we can do to earn or, des- or to deserve this citizenship, there's something we must do to attain it. And that's respond to God's offer of citizenship in His kingdom. We accept the offer. That means we choose to begin following Jesus. To receive God's forgiveness, which means admitting we need to receive forgiveness. And it means we give Jesus our primary loyalty. Now in most countries, you receive a citizenship card or a citizenship papers when you become a citizen, especially if you weren't born a citizen. You some, in some way, when you become one, you receive these papers. In the kingdom of God, the sign is different and it's twofold. We call them sacraments. Baptism, being baptized. Basically, we try to drown you and then we raise you back up. <laughs> Put you down in the water, bring you back up out of the water, symbolizing your death and your resurrection into Christ, into the kingdom of God. And the sacrament of Holy Communion. Those two visible acts our sacraments. They remind us that our citizenship is in another kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And that's one of the ways that the kingdom of God goes completely against the flow of the currents of this world. That's one of the ways we, as followers of Christ, go against the flow of the current of this world. No, it doesn't mean that the kingdom of God isn't tangible or that it isn't for this world that we call home. You see, God's good world consists of two spaces, two spheres. The Bible calls them the heavens and the earth. Heaven, which is God's space, and earth, the cosmos, which God has created for us to inhabit. Now, in Christ, and through the Holy Spirit, and through angels, God moves freely between and through both spaces. He's fully present everywhere. God's active and present in this world through the Holy Spirit and through those of us who follow Jesus. We are standard bearers for the kingdom of God. That was the plan from the beginning. But He's given us this world, this cosmos, as a gift, a place for us to inhabit, a place for us to to live and enjoy relationship with Him. Now the plan from the beginning was that God would have on this earth a people who would reveal to the world what it looks like to live as human beings in right relationship with God, as citizens in the kingdom of God. Now that was in the Old Testament, that was the role of Israel. But Israel couldn't do it. Now truthfully, no people were going to be able to do it. That was the whole point. So God in Christ did for them and for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Christ lived and served as that perfect Israel, revealing to us how to live in a relationship with God and making it possible through his death and resurrection for us to do that. No people were going to be able to do it, so God did it for them in Christ. And when we place our faith in Christ and begin to follow Christ, we begin to fulfill that role in the world too. We reveal to the world day in and day out what it looks like, what it means to enjoy grace and forgiveness and live as children of God, citizens of God's kingdom. You see, the point of the kingdom of God is not to get the people of God out of this world and into God's presence in heaven. The point of the kingdom of God is to break into this world. For now, in the individual lives of believers, and then globally when Christ returns. Because Christ is returning here. Not just to steal us away, but to set up His rule and His reign. And yes, there will come a time when this earth passes away. 
But even then, the direction of flow is bringing heaven to earth. Look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. A new what? Heaven and earth. Everything is new. Both of the old ones are gone. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Which direction are things flowing here? New Jerusalem is coming from heaven to earth. The flow is from heaven to earth. And then it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Where is this happening? Where is the new Jerusalem? It's on the new earth. Heaven Come to earth. God with humanity. It isn't about getting us out of here. It's about getting God into us here. And it's all about making things new. The way God intended the creation to be from the beginning. So when you and I pray, your kingdom come. We are acknowledging that we are citizens of another kingdom. And that's where our primary loyalty lies. No matter who sits on the thrones of this earth. Whether it was Caesar in Rome. Or the Queen in Parliament in England. Or the President in the White House here. And we are praying in hope for that day when the holy city descends from the new heaven to the new earth. We are praying for the establishment in its fullness of Christ's rule and reign. And we're acknowledging that it's come now in our hearts. We're saying, your kingdom come and start with me. Start in my heart, right here, right now. I submit my will to your will. I submit my desires to your desires. I submit my goals to your goals. Start with me. Because right now, that's where the kingdom of God is. We're saying, make me your kingdom bearer. But we need to understand that we are submitting not to an evil dictator or a manipulative demagogue. We are submitting to our loving Heavenly Father as His children. We are submitting to our good shepherd who cares for us, who guides us, who protects us, who wants what's best for us, and yes, who sometimes has to correct us. That's who we're submitting ourselves to. That's the ruler in the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, our Good Shepherd. Again, R.C. Sproul, who I quoted earlier, at one point he did a series of lectures. Uh, that was back in 1990. He did a series of lectures to Christians in three Eastern European countries. Uh, the countries were Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Romania. And I'll let him tell the story. He says, as we were leaving Hungary, we were warned that the border guards in Romania were quite hostile to Americans and that we should be prepared to be hassled and possibly even arrested at the border. And sure enough, when our rickety train reached the border of Romania, two guards got on. 
Now, they couldn't speak English, but they pointed to our passports. And then they pointed to our luggage. And they wanted us, we thought, to bring our bags down from the luggage rack and open them. And they were very brusque and rude. Then suddenly their boss appeared, a burly officer who spoke some broken English. And he noticed that one of the women in our group had a paper bag in her lap and there was something peeking out of it. And the officer said, what, what this? What in bag? And then he opened up the bag himself and he pulled out a Bible. And I thought, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. We're Americans with a Bible. And the officer began leafing through the Bible and looking over the pages very rapidly. And then he stopped and he looked at me. I was holding my American passport. And he said, you know American. And he said to the same thing to the others in our group, you know American. You know American. You know American. But then he smiled and said, I'm not Romanian. By now we were quite confused because he was obviously Romanian and we were obviously married. But he pointed to the text and gave it to me and said, read what it says. And I looked at it and it said, our citizenship is in heaven. The guard was a Christian. And he turned to his subordinates and said, let these people alone. They're okay. They're Christians. As you can imagine, I said, thank you, Lord. But this man understood something about the kingdom of God. That our first place of citizenship is in the kingdom of God. My loyalties may be divided between two states. My license plate says Michigan. The rest of my truck says Ohio. But my citizenship is in one place. Amen. The kingdom of God. My primary sovereign isn't a constitution, although I honor and respect our constitution and I live by it. It isn't a dictator. My sovereign is my loving and good heavenly father. But he is my sovereign. And so I pray, your kingdom come and start with me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> it doesn't get any clearer than that. And so we pray, your kingdom come in this world where we are and start with us in our homes. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.